looks like thank you mike <laughs> uh looks like people have gotten the link i got the notification that it was sent out so should be good to go um so my name is Amy Chapkovich. I'm the Director of Education and Communications at the Lower Marion Conservancy. And I wanna welcome you all to the Pollinator Pathway of Lower Marion and Narberth kickoff event with Pat Sutton. So um, I wanna say a huge thank you to St. Joseph's University for making our webinar possible. They're the, our hosts for tonight. And thank you to Mike McCann, Michael McCann, forgive me, um, Professor and Chair of the Biology Department at St. Joseph's um, and who is our technical moderator and helper tonight, should we need anything. Um, so I do wanna say for folks who are getting on and may have to get off a little later, um, this will be recorded. The recording's already started. Um, so if you need to put, uh, put one of your kids to bed or let the dog out, um, we'll send out the recording via email and it'll be posted on the Conservancy's website later on so that you can view anything you missed um, or take notes, uh, that sort. So um, we, ha uh, so I also want to say thank you to our partners. So um, the Lower this this event is being put on by the Lower Marion Conservancy, the Narberth Area Garden Club, the Friends of West Mill Creek Park, and Penn Valley Civic Association. So had to get through the names really quick there, but um, tonight's speaker. So again, Amy Chapkovich, that's me from the Lower Marion Conservancy. Um, Linda Pitt from the Narberth Area Garden Club, Michelle Detweiler from the Penn Valley Civic Association, and of course our featured speaker, Pat Sutton. So uh, I just wanna give everybody a heads up that we are probably gonna take our full time tonight, if not go a little over, since we have uh, a few speakers and um, a lot of good information to share. So at the end of this, there'll be time for Q&A with Pat. Um, but if you have questions along the way, I'll be moderating the chat box and I will try to feed them um, to folks as we get them if they are relevant. Uh, if not, we'll hold them out for the end. Um, so I wanna start off by um, passing the uh, baton over to Linda Pitt from the Narberth Area Garden Club to welcome, um, say some welcoming remarks. So go ahead, Linda. Okay, thank you so much, Amy. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone. This is the opening of the 2020-21 season of the Narberth Area Garden Club, and it's our 16th year. We are delighted to be co-hosting tonight's program with the Lower Marion Conservancy and our other partners. The Garden Club hosts meet monthly programs on the first Thursday of every month from October to May. You can check out our website by just putting in Narberth Area Garden Club to find out about our future programs and also how to become a member. If membership's not for you, you can see how on our website how to attend programs as a guest. Please check out our Facebook page also, um, which we use to share information about resources, about plants, and, and people are often giving away plants, and there's other information there as well. That's also under Facebook and the Narberth Area Garden Club. We are so glad to have you join us for this exciting program tonight. And we hope everyone here will spread the word so we can get be part of helping to save the ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, so now our first speaker tonight is Michelle Detweiler, who is a native plant consultant and head of the Penn Valley Civic Association. She's gonna talk, share information about the Pollinator Pathway Program, how it got started, so Michelle, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that you can go ahead and share yours. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm also very excited to be here tonight to help kick off the Lower Marion and Narberth Pollinator Pathway. I hope all of you will sign up to join the pathway and you can find our website at pollinator-pathway.org. Search for Pennsylvania Pathways and we will be the first one you find because we're the first in Pennsylvania, so it's very exciting. Uh, you can also get to that website through the Lower Marion Conservancy website. 
Pathways typically refer to spaces for human use, but this pathway is unique in that it's meant to be a year-round corridor of healthy habitat for pollinators, butterflies, bees, moths, hummingbirds, and other wildlife. Native bees like this one are some of our most important pollinators. They efficiently and purposefully carry pollen and cross-pollinate our trees and shrubs and plants, ensuring that they set seed. Uh, a continuation of nature as we know it and the many services that we as humans depend on as part of nature ourselves. There are natural workhorses. We have 437 native bee species in Pennsylvania. This doesn't include the introduced uh, non-native honeybee that we tend to be more familiar with, but native bees don't travel very far in, in provisioning their nests. They have uh, been looking for nectar and pollen. So the more healthy habitat that we have in our spaces and our growing pathway, the more we can begin to conserve these species on our own uh, properties. And as, we, as we've used our land over the years, um, there's heavy land use and many of the bees are and, and other pollinators are stressed by this because there's little pristine remaining habitat. So these are pictures of Lower Marion and Narberth historic photos uh, to remind us about our land use. We basically cleared the the forest, the native habitat that was here, and we've um, used the land for agriculture. We've introduced a lot of transportation infrastructure, rail lines and roads. We've built big institutions, uh, and we've divided a lot of big estates into smaller and smaller parcels for development. And what this does is it begins to fragment the land. And we haven't put the habitat back that, that was here, and what we have put back has not been very valuable, and we haven't, and we haven't put enough. So, you can imagine why insects are uh, in decline around, around the world, really, this has happened all over. 13% of bee species that were recorded in Pennsylvania just 20 years ago have not been reported since then. The good news is that we can begin to reconcile our heavy use of the land uh, with the needs of pollinators and other wildlife by beginning to add more valuable plantings and habitat around our built infrastructure, around our buildings and our homes, our front yards, our backyards, our libraries and parks and, and business institutions, so that if we don't have enough habitat forage on our property for nesting bees, for example, those bees can travel to nearby neighbors or down the road uh, to another property that's suitable for them. So the goal, of course, is to support the pollinators in all of their stages, both larval and adult uh, stages, and Pat Sutton's going to talk to you about that, and, and you'll get lots of inspiration from her. But in doing this, we support all kinds of wildlife in, in, in just thinking about the pollinators. We think about the birds and how dependent they are on insects and arthropods to raise their young, the thousands that they need to raise one brood. And we, in turn, get to see these beautiful species in our spaces. Often, they're migrating through and stopping for resources. So the benefits uh, of joining the pathway are many, including, including for the entire food chain and the watershed. These are the principles of joining the pathway, uh, incorporating native plants, reducing invasive species over time, avoiding pesticides, and leaving some winter habitat on your property. So I'm going to tell you about those principles more, but I just first want to tell you that we're part of a larger project called the Pollinator Pathway Northeast. And this is, this is a map showing existing towns that have adopted the program, and there are over 85 or 90 already. It was started in New York and Connecticut. So every butterfly you see on that map is a town that signed up to be on the pathway, and you can see that, that the pathway is growing in towns and also between towns to create habitat along this East Coast corridor. And it was started in 2017 by an environmental, environmentalist working on the border of New York and Connecticut. And she had an idea to give away native Eastern dogwood trees like you see here blooming in between, um, in between two towns across the border that were four miles apart. And the idea was that you would have a corridor of these beautiful trees that would also support the wildlife that depends on them. The spring azure butterfly that you see in the top that depends on the leaves of the tree and the native bees that pollinate, that use the pollen and nectar and then cross pollinate the tree so that it sets nutritious berries for migrating birds. So if we think about this idea in our own area, this is a map of Lower Marion and Narberth, and this is just a thought experiment. 
But what if we could begin to create pathways, for example, with healthy habitat around West Floral Hill Cemetery uh, that could be connected with the Belmont, the area around the Belmont Hills Pool and the Belmont Hills Library, which might be, be then connected to habitat through private properties along the Schuylkill River. We know how important uh, water is to wildlife. This could be connected with some of our religious institutions and our existing resources at Mill Creek Valley Park and Rolling Hill Park and, of course, the, the gardens at the Lower Marion Conservancy which could then be connected to some of our natural preserves. And so you can imagine this expanding all over our town um, as neighbors adopt the pathway and, and spread the word. We know that every property is important because every property hosts insects and birds and every property has the potential to contribute to more habitat, which is so valuable these days. So our pathway has not been open for sign up very long, but look at the number of properties that have already signed up to be on. This is very exciting, public and private properties. This encompasses 200 acres. And um, so hopefully we can grow this by spreading the word. Lower Marion and Narberth are over 15,000 acres. So there's a lot of opportunity there. A minimum for being on the pathway is incorporating a native tree, planting a native tree, one or many. You could also uh, start a pollinator garden and by removing a portion of lawn, any size would be fine, or simply replace the non-native shrubs that are around your uh, foundation. Often our foundation shrubs are non-native invasive species and it would go a long way to, re to replacing your privet and barberry, the non-native viburnums and the burning bush that otherwise invade our natural spaces and just replace them with native shrubs. Uh, something you feel, feel good about looking at. This is a reminder that, that our native plants have special uh, properties and the sunflowers, for example, feed specialist bees. So just like monarchs can only eat the uh, leaves of milkweed, some of our bees can only eat certain pollen and they're called specialists. And this is an example of one here in Andrina helianthi. It can only eat the pollen from sunflower species. So by incorporating sunflower species in your gardens, you can begin to conserve this uh, native bee species in Pennsylvania. And this same is true with asters and many other plants. You'll see the purple uh, in the middle here. Those are asters. And this Andrina asteroides depends solely on the pollen from aster species. And of course, these are highly valuable as larval host plants too. Our asters, our goldenrods, and our sunflowers, and so many more. And I encourage you to visit the National Wildlife Federation to learn about um, which plants are the most valuable to incorporate. So the second principle of the pathway is to remove invasive species over time. And, and you can simply Google invasive plants in Pennsylvania and you'll uh, find the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources and you might be surprised at the list, but this sort of requires getting to know what's on your property and learning the names of the plants you have and, and uh, begin to eliminate some of the vines that are really taking the space of native plants, including winter creeper and English ivy. These spread to, to natural areas. And, um, and we talked about the shrubs that are, that are invasive. There are many trees as well. And these have really creeped in without us noticing because they, they, they look beautiful, but they're not serving the wildlife and therefore not really participating in the ecosystem. And these include armor cork trees, like you see on the bottom right here in Norway maples. And so when you look at a bird's eye view of Lower Marion and Narberth, it looks like a lot of greenery and a lot of potential for existing habitat. And we do have quite a bit, particularly with our mature native trees, which are really sustaining our ecosystem. But we're losing a lot of those trees. We're not necessarily replanting natives. And uh, in deer prone areas, they're really eating down all of those new saplings that are trying to come up to reforest our, our woodland areas. So I think it's very important that we begin to learn our trees and remove the invasive species and plant new ones and protect them from the deer if that's, if that's an issue. And the other greenery that we see here that there's too much of is lawn. And lawn is not a valuable habitat type on, on the whole and there's too much of it. It tends to be a monoculture of a non-native grass species that requires a lot of uh, resource input, a lot of water, a lot of chemicals to, to maintain that monoculture. It doesn't have a lot of biomass. So there's not a lot for any insect to eat. There's not, there aren't places for it to nest or, or to find cover. And um, so keeping the amount of lawn that you need for recreation or pathways could be important, but, but replacing the rest of it with more valuable plantings could go a long way in helping the pollinators, benefiting the watershed, and of course, um, drawing all that excess carbon that we have in the atmosphere into the soil uh, to help with climate change going forward.
So the third principle of the pathway is to avoid pesticides. For uh, Many are used on lawns, as I mentioned, um, including herbicides and, and chemical fertilizers. Um, but insecticides and fungicides are also, also a, a real problem. So if this is happening on your property where you're spraying for mosquitoes or ticks, you're really killing a lot of other insects, both right during the spraying time and afterwards as insects try to use the resources in your yard. There, there are no mosquito or tick specific insecticides. And it's better to allow native, a diversity of native plants to grow in your space and so you achieve an equilibrium of predator and prey because these sprays are killing the uh, predators of the mosquitoes that could otherwise be providing a natural solution. So we can't rely on chemicals for everything and uh, this is an important part of the pathway to keep our spaces as chemical free as possible. The fourth principle of the pathway is to leave winter habitat, and we, all, we often pay for this to be removed, but dead plant material is as important as living plant material, even though it doesn't seem like that to us. It's a place for uh, bees to nest and for moths to overwinter. Often in those leaves, you'll have uh, cocoons of moths that are camouflaged, and when you blow those away, you're blowing away the first generation of pollinators for the next season. So this is a reminder of how native bees nest. They either nest in the ground on the left-hand side um, solitarily like this, and their whole goal in life is to go out and get pollen and nectar and bring it back to their larva, or they nest in stems, uh, like you see on the right-hand side. This is a cross-section of a stem, and in each one of these cells is a bee larva. So if you remove all of the stems and all of the dead wood from your space, you're removing a tremendous amount of habitat. And this goes to thinking about pollinator habitat as a year round experience versus just uh, blooming, just the growing season from spring to fall, which is also extraordinarily important. Uh, but this is an example of what you can do in your space for winter habitat. You can leave leaves on the ground in your perennial beds or particularly around your trees and shrubs. It looks natural. It blends in. It provides just the right organic matter for the trees that it, that it falls under. And it provides a duff layer where native bees can overwinter and make it through our winters underneath there and where all the, the cocoons of the moths in particular um, can make it over the winter as well. And then this is an example of cutting a perennial back to 18 inches, leaving 18 inches of stem so that the bees can nest in there either during, um, sometimes they try to overwinter, mostly they're there during the growing season. So to recap, incorporate native plants, remove invasive species over time, avoid pesticides, and leave winter habitat to join the pathway. This is our website, uh, which is pollinator-pathway.org, and you can again search for the Lower Marion and Narberth Pollinator Pathway. Here you'll see examples of existing gardens on the pathway. This is the West Mill Creek, Friends of West Mill Creek um, Park Wildlife Garden, native plants, no pesticides. This is the Narberth Train Station Garden, native plants, no pesticides, uh, also a Monarch Way station there. These are the gardens at the Conservancy and a traffic island that we take care of in Penn Valley. So there are resources on here uh, that as, as you scroll down, you'll see those and you can click on those. You'll have plant lists, ideas for where to buy from nurseries and so forth. And then you can click this tab right here to join the pathway. It'll pull up a form. You put in your name and your address and um, you opt in or out of being on the public map so that we can see your space and, and see how our pathway is growing over time. And then finally, you can purchase a sign if you'd like from the Lower Marion Conservancy for $10. These are little six inch signs that say this property is on the pollinator pathway, native plants, pesticide free. And these might be particularly important if you're in a public space where it could be an educational resource to let people know about the efforts that you're, that you're making in your, um, in your space. So that's all I have. And I'm, I'm glad to answer any questions that popped up in the chat. Amy, if you, if you see any there um, before, before we hear um, the great sure. talk from Pat Sutton. Thank you, Michelle. So um, folks right now in the chat are actually talking about how to facilitate conversation with your neighbors about mosquito spraying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, uh, you've said this before, but um, these things travel. So if you have an organic lawn, but your neighbor doesn't, it's going to be a problem for the pollinators on your yard. So maybe if you could address that. And someone said maybe if you have a suggestion for an article that they could print and give to them, perhaps. To the that's a good idea. Yeah. I always 
they sharing the science? Pe people often spray out of fear, right? We're, we're scared, we're trying to do right by our children to keep them from getting diseases. Uh, one thing to remember is we don't have a lot of mosquito-borne illness here. We do not have Zika virus. We basically don't have West Nile. I mean, the township tests for West Nile all the time, and if they find it, they choose to spray certain areas. But they're really checking for us on a regular basis. So. Uh, to me, there's not a lot to worry about, and there's so much you can do just to protect yourself, put fans out, uh, remove standing water, and things, you know, for, for mosquitoes. There's drift. When they spray those sprays, they can, if it's a windy day, it will drift into your space. Often pe people who have the sprays are unhappy because they'll drift into areas where they didn't want it on their own property, and it'll, they'll, they notice all the monarchs are suddenly dead on their milkweed that they ask not to be sprayed, but it's, it's going to drift. And, and uh, it's a tricky subject because I know it's, it's a business. And um, so I'm sorry about that, but it's, it's not good for the environment. And let, let's look for some articles that maybe we can share after this. I don't, um, it's an up, it, this requires cooperation, which is what's so neat about the pathway is, you know, really we're talking about cooperating across property lines, which, which is what is required with the mosquito spraying. Uh, I don't know if that helps, but yeah, it does. Thank you. And I think that's a great answer. And, you know, for everybody uh, who's going to get a sign, you know, the sign is not just about, um, you know, recognizing yourself on your own property, but it maybe is letting that neighbor know who doesn't know anything about pollinators showing about why your lawn is blooming in three seasons, why maybe there's less physical grass lawn or something. So it can really represent the things you believe in that could be a, a, a conversation piece, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question about um, when you cut stems, do they have to be upright or can they be cut and left on the ground? Often stems will fall over on their own. So if I cut stems that, uh, if I cut stems that I want to keep and, and allow uh, the insects to emerge often, if you, it's, I think it's good to keep them upright because it keeps them from rotting. So I'll just often put them in a bunch and lean them against a fence somewhere or put them, you know, put them out of the way um, if, if visually it, it bothers you. But I think it, it can be important to, to leave them upright uh, like you would, you would find them. I think it's probably also fine if if you're as long as you're not crushing them you know i okay. think it's probably fine to lay them in a pile somewhere yes so, yeah awesome so that is the majority of the questions so i'm going to go ahead and go into the conservancies bit um thank you so much michelle for um sharing a little bit about the pathway again everybody you can register for that pathway both on the pollinator pathways website we're dash marion narberth and on the lower marion conservancies website that's also, once you register, you'll also be prompted if you would like to purchase a sign, it's optional. Um, but again, if you wanna have conversations with your neighbors, maybe there's something, uh, a conversation piece about spraying and pollinators, et cetera. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. So everybody give me one moment. Awesome. So again, my name is Amy Chepkovich. I'm with the Lower Marion Conservancy. If you aren't familiar with the Conservancy, I see many of our members' faces on here. So again, thanks for joining us. But we are a membership-supported nonprofit that works to protect the watershed, open space, and historic character of both Narberth and Lower Marion. So um, you may have, we're the host of, one of the hosts of the events this night. And again, the hosts of the, we're, we're the organization that is holding the pollinator pathway signs. So if you choose to get one, you will either, you will get that in the mail from us. So I'm here to talk today though. I am the conservancies, one of the conservancies environmental educators, and I'm here to tell you about watersheds and how they are related to pollinators. So here in Lower Marion, we have about just over a dozen watersheds and a watershed is an area of land that drains both surface and groundwater into a common source. Some people call them water bowls. You can think of it kind of as that shape. Um, and it drains them into a common source like a stream, creek, reservoir, or bay. Here in Lower Marion and Narberth, our community streams drain into the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers. Um, we do not in our community drink from those rivers, but those are drinking water sources for downstream communities. So it's important for us as upstream neighbors to do our best to protect them. Um, now, our streams within Lower Marion and Narberth, unfortunately, these streams um, are considered uh, impaired by the, Pen the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP. 
So um, they're impaired for several different reasons, but one of the main reasons um, is that these streams are impacted by stormwater runoff. So you can take a look at this image and on the left side of the image, uh, the stormwater or water cycle image, if you will, um, we have sort of a natural environment where when it rains, about 50% of water is, about, is able to soak into the ground, 10% becomes runoff, which is very little. Um, but if you look at the right-hand image, uh, you're, we're um, in a developed community, which is Lower Marion and Narberth, who are a highly developed community. Most of rainwater is gonna become runoff. So that is 55% about of the rain that hits the ground has to travel over um, paved surfaces. So rain, stormwater ru rain becomes stormwater runoff when it cannot soak into the ground and it carries pollutants from streets, sidewalks, lawns, and roofs to local streams via our storm drain system. So in Lower Marion and Narberth, our storm drains do not go to the water treatment plant. They, go, they drain directly to our local streams. Um, so it's really important for us to be sort of naturalizing um, paved and developed spaces so that we can have natural infl infiltration and sort of restore the, the natural water cycle. So when we're thinking about our community streams, a lot of them have um, eroded stream banks. So they're missing their riparian buffer and the riparian buffer is a natural area um, on either side of the stream that has plants that are water loving and soil holding. Now, unfortunately in Lower Marion and Narberth, we have issues with a lot of invasive plants on the edges of our stream beds. Um, and so when we're talking about the pollinator pathway, increasing the amount of native plants planted in our community, um, we really wanna do that because they're able to absorb stormwater. They allow more water to soak into the ground instead of again, becoming runoff and traveling and overwhelming our streams. Um, and they do that by breaking up compacted soil with their deep roots. So if you look at this image in the upper left-hand corner there, we have a side-by-side -side comparison of non-native plants, um, which are kind of sort of these popular flowers like daylilies um, compared to native plants and you can see the root system. So the depth of this chart goes up to 15 feet. The average non-native plant is gonna go no deeper than three feet. And your turf grass, which is our most common like plant in most of our yards, um, their root systems don't even go a foot. They're really just a few inches deep, um, which is not effective in absorbing water. It's not effective in retaining soil and holding soil in place. Um, it's not except, uh, really excellent for filtering pollution almost nothing. It's, some people call it a uh, green asphalt because it does so little. So uh, the deep roots though, on the other hand of native plants, um, these are really going to be able to protect stream banks by holding soil in place, preventing erosion. I'm sure some of you after uh, Tropical Storm Isaiah drove past Mill Creek and you saw, I mean, huge chunks of, of fresh soil gone, washed away, um, with this, with the storm. So really needing the, we really need these deep roots to help hold our stream banks in place. Um, and this is where the pollinators come in. So pollinators are needed to really help native plants re-establish areas that have over, been overwhelmed by aggressive invasive plants like Japanese knotweed, which is really common on the sides of our roads and the sides of our streams. Um, like Michelle said, these pollinators are gonna help reseed native plants and they're gonna help them really establish and spread. Um, a lot of our native plants actually are pretty good at spreading. Once they take root, they're gonna be able to do what they need to do. They just sort of need our help to get established and, um, and they need the pollinators to be there as well. So establishing this pathway will really help us extend, native, extend and expand the impact of native plants in our community. Um, so as a recent project, the Conservancy has been working with the Friends of the Kinwood Heritage Trail to install native plants and shrubs along Vine Creek, which is right along the Kinwood Heritage Trail, if you didn't know what the name of that cute little creek is. And um, this is really helping to restore not only pollinator habitat, but um, positively impacting um, stormwater uh, absorption. So something else with, um, from sort of branching off from Michelle's uh, section on leaving winter habitat. So uh, at the Conservancy, we encourage you to leave the leaves on your lawn. I'm sure you've heard this campaign by now, um, but leaves really help to restore organic matter in the soil, which naturally retains more water. So not only are we 
going to hit the soil with deep rooted native plants, but we're going to create more um, rich soil to help absorb that water. Um, they also provide food and habitat for macroinvertebrates, which are insects that are living in sh underwater in streams. And these macroinvertebrates, their life cycle starts with leaves. So if we remove them from our community, they're not able to feed um, and, and develop in the way they need to. So removing leaves takes away valuable winter habitat as well as food sources for vulnerable pollinators. So be sure to leave them in your garden. Um, so, all, so stormwater solutions that the Conservancy works on really help pollinators. So we help people install rain gardens, um, give guidance on how to install rain barrels and downspout planters, all of which are populated and filled with native plants with those deep water loving root systems. And um, what I wanna leave you all with is that not only can you use the tips and tools from the Pollinator Pathways website, to help establish native plants for our vulnerable pollinators. But the Conservancy also has a rain garden guide on our website that can help you to establish not only a native plant garden, but a water loving, rain absorbing, stormwater filtering native plant garden that will serve to create habitat for um, wildlife and um, really help our community uh, string along those pieces together on the pathway. So, um, I am gonna pass this along. So thank you again all for joining us. I'm gonna pass this along to Pat Sutton now. So Pat, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce you. Uh, so Pat Sutton is a freelance writer, photographer, naturalist, environmental educator, and pollinator gardening expert. She uses her own wildlife garden, which we will see later in this presentation, as a teaching garden, and it's been featured in many programs, workshops, and garden tours. Um, among her many accomplishments, Pat is a founding board member of the North American Butterfly Association and has co-authored several books about the natural world with her husband. So I could go on about Pat, but I want to give her plenty of time to talk about pollinator gardens and give people time to ask questions. So I won't go on. Pat, I hand it over to you now. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Amy and Linda and Michelle, for those great introductions to this terrific project that you are undertaking, and I'm very thrilled to be part of it. I am going to um, dive into my program, and I certainly love questions, but I'm going to uh, take them at the end, if that's okay with everybody. So have a notepad ready and be ready to jot things down. I am honored to be part of this kickoff event for the Pollinator Pathway in, in Lower Marion and Narbeth, Pennsylvania. There are excellent resources to help you choose the right plants for your area on the website, including finding native plants appropriate for where you live and including native plant lists and most importantly, native plant nurseries and sales. Pollinator Pathways is carrying out what Doug Tallamy's newest book, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard, urges us all to do. Tallamy proposes that we can each play a role in saving the planet by saving and utilizing native plants in our own yards. Put all our yards together and we hopefully will be able to create a sizable wildlife refuge made up of yards. This program will provide the meaty knowledge of how to create a pollinator garden. We all garden, that's probably why you're part of this gathering tonight. And we all probably started by planting the same flowers everyone else was planting. Persithia, Bradford pear, impatience, geraniums, hydrangeas, 
crepe myrtle. Pretty, but none are native, and most are little used by butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators. They just take up space, and to a pollinator, they might as well be plastic. Tonight, I'm going to take you into my garden and shake things up. Open your eyes to the world of gardening for wildlife, which certainly includes gardening for pollinators. I have a three page handout that's on my website under gardening for pollinators, and it covers many of the basics that I will share with you tonight, including my list of chocolate cake natives, annuals, and some non native perennials that are not problematic. The list shares when they bloom so you can cover the seasons. My handout also shares links to certification of and signage for the habitat that you've created. And I'm of the mind, the more signs, the better. And I definitely have to update this handout to include the pollinator pathway sign. So those of you who were wondering how to sway the neighbor, get as many signs as you can on your property and trigger people to start thinking about why your yard looks so different from theirs. Show them something in your yard, like a monarch emerging from its chrysalis or a hummingbird that's nectaring on your bee balm. You'll get converts. It's as simple as opening their eyes to everything that gives you joy in the habitat that you've created. This program has a threefold mission. First, I'd love to open your eyes to native flowers and flowering plants that we can use in our gardens that will not only make it pretty, but turn it into a dinner table and supermarket for pollinators, butterflies, hummingbirds, bees, and many other creatures. I'd also like to give you an appreciation of many native plants that you'd previously only thought of as weeds. As you learn that these weeds are life-giving to various butterflies, birds, and other wildlife. And thirdly, to share with you wildlife-friendly gardening practices that will benefit wildlife drawn to your garden and yard, as opposed to gardening practices that make your gardens death traps to pollinators that you've attracted. I am hearing um, I guess some of the other presenters as you type. I don't know if maybe uh, you could mute while I do the program. You might not realize that it's, I think everyone's hearing it. Each year my garden creeps into the yard a bit more and the mowed portion diminishes, much to the delight of hummingbirds, butterflies, moths, a wonderful assortment of bees and me. Soon there will be nothing left to mow but pathways through wildflowers and woodlands. The first pollinator that we'll address is the ruby-throated hummingbird. They begin arriving in this area in mid-April, timing their arrival to coincide with early blooming plants like crabapple, apple, blueberry, azalea, black locust, tulip tree. And if a cold snap occurs on or a late snowstorm, they may survive by following a yellow-bellied sapsucker around and feeding from the sap flowing from trees and shrubs where the sapsucker has drilled its holes. During late snowstorms and cold snaps, like those we've experienced some springs, hummingbird feeders may be crucial to the survival of early hummingbirds. Two, this is what my garden looks like in April and early May, pretty sparse. So to intercept spring migrant hummingbirds and to attract nesting birds, I hang hummingbird feeders in mid-April. Most years a hummingbird buzzes in as I'm hanging the feeder and it's the males that arrive first. Until 2018, this website hummingbirds.net had interactive map showing the ruby-throated hummingbirds migration north. This map shows the ruby throat's breeding range in orange in the US and Canada. Most years, the first ones start arriving along the Gulf Coast in Texas, Louisiana, and Florida by late February. 
Often by early April, the first ones reach New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania. Though I often don't see the first ones in my Southern New Jersey garden until about April 20th. And you can see that by late April, there's often been a big push to get them as far north as Nova Scotia and Maine. By June 3rd, ruby-throated hummingbirds have returned to most of their breeding sites. This is the feeder that I prefer, the hum zinger, uh, mainly because it's easy to clean. The solution is on the inside of the lid, which shares not to use red dye, which is carcinogenic. And hummingbirds, if this is all you're going to do for them, you're really not treating them very well. They get their energy from nectar, so you want an extensive garden and supplement it with feeders, especially during slim pickings in spring. But could they live on chocolate cake alone? Not at all. Hummingbirds need protein as well, which they get from spiders and soft-bodied insects like aphids. So I let my flowers and my shrubs alone if insect pests appear. No pesticides in my garden. In fact, I don't fuss over insect pests knowing that hummingbirds and other native insect predators like ladybugs will probably take care of them. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are a constant presence until most of them migrate south in early September when their departure is triggered by cool evenings and cold fronts. They migrate south when our gardens are still full of their favorite nectar plants. Leave feeders hung through late fall and you might attract some of the late ruby-throated hummingbird migrants or young from a late nest and western strays like this rufous hummingbird. Beyond the use of feeders, a yard really should be crafted into a habitat and the perfect yard for hummingbirds provides good cover to nest and hide in, lots of nectar spring through fall, healthy insect populations, hence no insecticides. Shrub islands integrated into gardens are ideal for hummingbird activity since the first batch of young are stashed by mom in good cover near nectar. This sea of barren lawn is not a hummingbird haven, no matter how many feeders are hung nor is an unnaturally plant barren property like this. So go crazy with nectar offerings, especially since many of our yards are oases in a sea of lawns. This entire garden is on a septic field. And here's my own garden at different seasons. May 1st, June, July, August, September, October. Go overboard with nectar, insects, and wildlife habitat. I'm going to take you into the garden and show you some of our best hummingbird, butterfly, and bee plants. Many are native. In fact, most of us who have read Dick, Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, try to plant as many natives as possible. The subtitle of Tallamy's book says it all how native plants sustain wildlife in our gardens. Many of our native plants are also key caterpillar plants needed by our butterflies and moths for egg laying to create the next generation. 96% of our songbirds feed insects to their young, as this common yellow throat is about to do with its bill jam packed with butterfly and moth caterpillars. Each songbird gathers several hundred caterpillars a day to keep their young fed. We saw this firsthand with the pair of prothonotary warblers that nested in a wren roosting basket on our front porch for two years. They no sooner left the nest than they were back with another caterpillar or beak full of caterpillars. No doubt some of you have read Doug Tallamy's editorial in the New York Times several years ago, The Chickadee's Guide to Gardening, where he shared that one pair of chickadees 
Bring 300 to 570 caterpillars to the nest each day, depending on how many young they have in that nest. They feed their young for 16 to 18 days before the young fledge. So to raise one batch of young, the adult chickadees must find an incredible 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. They're going to find those caterpillars on native plants, not on the sea of non-native plants that most nurseries sell and that most homeowners plant. You might have a butterfly bush and think you're covering all the bases. Yes, it is a great nectar plant, but maybe you didn't know that it's native to China. That means that none of our butterflies and moths can lay the, their eggs on it, so it's a nectar source only. And despite looking pretty and attracting many insects, many of us no longer plant it in our gardens. Instead, we plant as many native nectar plants as possible, especially plants native to our area or the East or the US, nearly all of which provide nectar and are also used as caterpillar food plants by butterflies and moths. Do your research. Don't assume that nurseries are carrying the right plants. Surprisingly, many carry problem plants that are for good reason to be avoided, like periwinkle or vinca minor. And not only are nurseries adding to the invasive plant problem, but countless landscapers are also irresponsibly planting problem plants like vinca. Instead, choose a native plant or two or three. Remove the invasives that you might already have on your property and make room for more natives. Seriously consider replacing non-native plants with natives that will benefit wildlife. So here I am saying, hasta luego to my hostas, native to Northeast Asia. Many flowering plants attract hummingbirds. Most are tubular in shape and many are red, though certainly not all. Fos focusing on natives, here are some of our best nectar plants wild columbine. And where one or two plants probably won't pull in a hummingbird, a solid bed of it is irresistible. While wild columbine will grow in sun or shade, and here it is in my woods blooming lushly in the spring. Stay away from exotic columbines from elsewhere. This western columbine was planted in a Cape May Point garden. Ruby-throated hummingbirds could not reach the nectar and so couldn't pollinate the flowers and they petered out. The structure of this flower is meant for some of the Western hummingbirds with really long bills. And this is just one of many reasons to choose native plants from your region, like wild columbine. You may be planting with hummingbirds in mind, but obviously other pollinators will benefit. Here a bumblebee. The vine coral honeysuckle is another gem. It too blooms early, just in time for arriving hummingbirds. And it is a repeat bloomer, blooming right up until the frost. Carl bells also bloom in spring. They multiply and you can eventually create a large bed of them, keeping them in bloom by cutting the spent flower stalks. By June, bee balm or monarda is in bloom, a favorite with hummingbirds and so many other pollinators. Here, a hummingbird clear wing. And butterflies, like this pipevine swallowtail. Bee balm continues blooming through July and comes in different colors, red, white, pale pink. The wild bergamot is a soft pink and thrives in meadows and gardens and may bloom into August. It's always full of pollinators. Here with a tiger swallowtail. Cardinal flower, a stunning wildflower that likes wet feet blooms July through mid-September. Jewel weed is a summer and early fall hummingbird favorite, also liking wet feet. Trumpet creeper, a native vine is another favorite. Give it a sunny location and a structure to grow over. 
A cardinal rule in designing your garden for hummingbirds and butterflies is to include some annuals along with your perennials. Perennials are the easiest to garden with because they only need to be planted once and then they come up year after year. Annuals need to be planted every year, but they have a longer blooming period and can be tucked into bare spots in your garden as filler, like cardinal climber, Mexican sunflower. Each plant grows shrub-like with many branches and can be covered with 50 blooms at a time, summer through fall. And it's especially fun to watch hummingbirds and butterflies feeding for lengthy periods on a single flower, visiting one compartment after another. And I always save room for a bed of zinnias. They dazzle my eye and they draw in many pollinators and cannas. I plant patches of red cannas here and there in my gardens. The tall red accent is a delight and hummingbirds cannot resist them. Nor could Angie Walter's kids. Her canna patch doubled as their favorite hiding spot. Two, you can never plant enough salvias. Many as annuals each year. The core of my original garden was a large bed of scarlet sage, an annual available at nurseries in the early spring. The solid blast of red drew in hummingbirds. Today, I plant tropical or Texas stage instead because it's trouble-free, it keeps blooming, and it needs no deadheading. And hummingbirds love it. And it's best if planted in a big patch to catch the eye of hummingbirds. Black and blue salvia with its black base to the flower is another hummingbird magnet, as is its cousin, blue ensign. They each are nonstop nectar sources from mid-June until the frost and are perennial in my garden. Many of the flowers attractive to hummingbirds also attract butterflies, bumblebees, moths at night, and other important pollinators. We focused on hummingbirds up to now, but gardening for all pollinators comes naturally. And keep in mind that a garden full of nectar will make it easy to learn your butterflies, bees, and other pollinators. There are some cardinal rules for butterfly and hummingbird gardening, and the first one applies more to butterflies than to hummingbirds. Butterflies are solar powered. They need to be warm and dry to fly, and a simple cloud crossing over the sun will deflate butterfly activity from dozens during a sunny stretch to zero activity a few minutes later when cloudy. So when choosing a location for your butterfly garden, choose a sunny location or plan to plant a series of gardens that will take advantage of the sun as it moves across or through your yard. The butterflies will move from garden to garden with the sun. Another cardinal rule is to plant in masses. A garden with 100 different kinds of plants, one of each, is much less attractive to you and to pollinators than masses of the best nectar sources. Purple coneflower, anis hyssop, brown-eyed Susan, garden phlox, ironweed, wild bergamot, sweet pepperbush. One of the most important cardinal rules is to offer nectar spring through late fall. Red maple blossoms are sometimes the only show in town for very early spring pollinators. Here's one of our native bees, a mining bee, nectaring on red maple flowers. And here, a spring azure, which is a butterfly, doing the same. Plus, Doug Tallamy shares that 285 species of butterflies and moths lay their eggs on our native maples. Yet sadly, the nursery down the road is full of Norway maples, and none of those butter these butterflies can lay their eggs on that tree. While we are enjoying the garden here on July 26th, many of these nectar plants will be done blooming in late August and September. 
So you want to plant masses of other native perennials that will shine as the seasons unfold. Here, two months later, on September 20th, cutleaf coneflower, late flowering thoroughwort, tall sunflower, smooth blue aster, and New England aster in the foreground. And another example of providing nectar all season long. Here's my common milkweed bed in full flower in late June. So providing nectar and a crucial host plant to monarchs. But by August, milkweed is pretty much done blooming and the patch looks a little gnarly, but I of course leave it standing because monarchs will lay eggs on it right through the fall. So two years ago, I had a brainstorm and planted tall sunflowers, which are a native perennial, in the milkweed bed and also began tucking in annuals like Mexican sunflower and zinnias. And here is that bed on September 20th, full of nectar. The milkweed plants are still there and monarch caterpillars were all over the milkweed plants when I took this photo and they were finding lots of protection under the overhanging sunflowers. Another cardinal rule is that weeds are not all that bad. In fact, they may offer some of the only nectar in early spring or late fall. In April, I let wild mustard grow where it wants in my garden. The same with purple dead nettle, sometimes the only nectar available in March and April. Here with a native bumblebee on it, April 6th. And chickweed, here with a Henry's elfin on it, April 3rd. And clover with a sachem, one of our skippers. Clover is such an excellent nectar plant that I seed bare patches in my yard with grass seed mixed with clover seeds. Clover is also a nitrogen fixer, which enriches the soil with natural fertilizer. And the bane of our society, dandelion, if only folks would sit back and see that butterflies, bees, here a European honeybee, and so many pollinators depend on this flower in spring, sometimes the only nectar available. Choose native plants that are tough enough to cope with the weather that your garden faces, whether it's lengthy periods of freezing temperatures, a blistering heat wave, or torrential rains. Purchase your plants at native plant nurseries near you that are stocked with plants suitable to your area and conditions. Moving into summer, let's look at additional nectar plants. Some flowers are irresistible to butterflies and hummingbirds and bees, and no matter what else is in bloom, they are drawn to them. My friend Jane Ruffin has dubbed these the chocolate cakes of the flower world. Many of the flowers I've shared and am about to share are chocolate cakes. Though each yard is different, purple coneflower are tops in some gardens, but for years they attracted just a few butterflies in my garden, perhaps because I only had a scattered few. When I planted a big patch of purple coneflower, in other words, a mass of them, then they drew in the butterflies, which spent lengthy periods on each flower head. Another cardinal rule stick with natives and avoid cultivars. Natives are often covered with poll pollinators, cultivars not so much. And I'm wondering if any of you were tempted to buy these, the tiki torch coneflower. Beware. Cultivars are plants created or selected for specific characteristics such as early blooming or color, often at the expense of nectar. And a good example is the new rage for odd colored coneflowers. Some are, are awfully pretty, but offer absolutely no nectar. Some other problems with cultivars, sometimes the leaf chemistry is changed and butterflies can no longer lay eggs on them with success. So, I certainly have no interest in cultivars. I want the straight natives. 
Other chocolate cakes for pollinators, pickerel weed, if you have a pond, it begins blooming in June. Various milkweeds are chocolate cakes and in full bloom in late June, early July. Garden flocks here with a hummingbird clearwing, blazing star or liatris. Culver's root, another late June through July bloomer, blooming simultaneously with purple coneflower. Cutleaf coneflower, anise hyssop, blooms on and on and on. And mountain mint, attracts both large and small butterflies, here with a tiny juniper hair streak, and it's always covered with so many different bees and ornate flies and wasps that are also important pollinators. Here, a sand wasp. Heather Holmes' excellent book, Pollinators of Native Plants, will help you ID and appreciate all of your garden guests. As will her newest book, Bottom Right, on bees, along with these other great pollinator books. All the eupatoriums are chocolate cakes, plus Doug Tallamy shares that 42 butterflies and moths lay their eggs on native eupatoriums, like this one, Joe Pieweed, which blooms late July through August. Here it is with a mess of tiger swallowtails. Also during that period, bone set, another eupatorium and chocolate cake is blooming. Later come September, late flowering thoroughwort, a big bushy eupatorium covered in flowers and always covered in pollinators, including quite rare butterflies like these white M hair streaks. And one more eupatorium, mist flower, here with an American copper. Think of the plants in your garden as friends, especially if they were shared by fellow gardeners. I mark my plants with these wonderful tall plant markers, which can be easily moved as the plant grows. I note who gave me the plant and when. And these markers have kept me from making the mistake of digging up my cherished plants in the spring, thinking they are a weed something each of us has probably done at some point. Ironweed is a chocolate cake late July through August. Taller giant sunflower, not only great nectar, but 73 butterflies and moths need and use our native sunflowers for egg laying to create the next generation. So important to migrating monarchs in the fall. Sedum comes into bloom in mid-August. Ours was so full of painted ladies one fall that one of our leopard frogs left the pond to partake of the smorgasbord. Opportunistic little bugger. Sedum continues to bloom right into the fall when monarchs are on the move en masse. Sedum is a favorite with so many of our native pollinators, many dazzling bees and wasps, like this potter wasp. Also in August and September, sneezeweed. In September and October, asters and goldenrods kick in as chocolate cake. New England aster here with a mess of migrating monarchs and a sneaky praying mantis feeding on one after the next. There are so many native asters, all lovely. And beyond nectar, you can see from Doug Tallamy's studies that asters and goldenrods are at the top of perennials for being able to be used by butterflies and moths for egg laying. 112 species of butterflies and moths lay their eggs on native asters, including these pearl crescents. And asters are favorites with native bees. Here, one of the bumblebees. And notice how this leaf cutter bee is covered with pollen. Seaside goldenrod, so beautiful, blooming next to a variety of native asters. 115 species of butterflies and moths lay their eggs on our native goldenrods. Goldenrod blooms at the peak of the monarch migration. It's also especially important to support nurseries that carry native plants and be sure to in, 
to include in your plan and in your planting some native shrubs like button bush, which blooms in early July, sweet pepper bush, which blooms in late July and August, here with the hungry tiger swallowtail. Groundsel tree blooms in late September and offers key nectar for hungry monarchs. You've got to have faith in native plants. This is what groundsel tree looks like most of the year and probably what it looks like at a nursery when you go to buy it, quite nondescript. But in bloom, I think you'll agree that it is a showstopper and a pollinator magnet. My pollinator program is heavy on butterflies, but realize that all pollinators, bees and flies, wasps, beetles, are important and part of the package, and they all need our help. The decline of pollinators is a worldwide threat and has been described as an insect apocalypse due to the loss of wildflower patches, due to extensive use of pesticides like neonicotinoids, due to the fact that lawn is our largest crop, covering over 48 million acres in the US. And realize that your efforts will benefit all pollinators here, mating soldier beetles on sneezeweed, green sweat bees. There are 21 species of bumblebees in the east. I have yet to ID this gorgeous one. This neat bee is a male carpenter mimic leafcutter bee and the female, looking like a different species. This beautiful pollinator is the transverse flower fly, a bee mimic. And this one inch long pollinator is a yellow jacket hoverfly. So you can see that flies play an important role as pollinators too. Many are quite stunning and you'll get to study and learn them in your pollinator garden. Truly plant it and they will come. There are about 4,000 native bees found in the US including the Southeastern blueberry bee seen here on blooming highbush blueberry. Many of our native bees are in trouble because of loss of nectar rich habitats as well as loss of nest sites. Many nest underground and you can see the newly piled nests where bits of soil are piled outside the nest hole. So for a closer look at the southeastern blueberry bee nests but where can they dig those nests in a typical neighborhood? The same for many of our turtles. They can't begin to dig through thick sod to lay their eggs. I've let part of my lawn grow up as a pocket meadow or mini meadow. In this meadow, there is a lot of loose soil for ground nesting bees and turtles looking to lay their eggs. Plus, the mini meadow is quite delightful and complements our perennial garden. And we've lined our woodland path with fallen tree trunks and limbs, since many bees will burrow down inside to lay their eggs. We've learned a lot about nectar and how critical it is to plant native plants, including not only wildflowers, but blooming shrubs and trees. Since they serve a dual purpose, nectar and many are key caterpillar plants. But I'm going to delve into butterfly biology deeper because it's important to wildlife gardeners to understand. Many of the plants butterflies and moths lay their eggs on are weeds or plants we don't appreciate. If you're keen on butterflies, it's not all about flowers. Most of a butterfly's life is spent becoming an adult butterfly. And once they've reached the adult butterfly stage, their primary function is reproduction. The adult butterfly usually lives about three weeks and in that brief time, they must find a mate and then the female must find the host plant to lay her eggs on. They need sunshine to fly so bad weather can take its toll and in your gardens, learn to recognize and try to supply as many host plants or caterpillar plants as possible. Each kind of butterfly uses a specific host plant 
So when looking for certain butterflies, it can be a real bonus if you know and can recognize their host plant. This being the case, you need to be a bit of a botanist to find certain butterflies since they are tied so closely to their host plant. It also makes sense that if you like butterflies and moths, the last thing you want to use are herbicides. We'll see tiger swallowtails from April through September. What we are seeing is not the same butterfly, but three different generations. These eastern tailed blues that are mating and quite tiny, the size of your thumbnail, lay their eggs on members of the pea family, like this rabbit's foot clover. We see about five different generations of monarchs all summer. And if you see monarchs mating, they are not part of the final fall generation that migrates to the mountains of Mexico. But instead, they are mating to create another generation and these summer adults will die after their one month lifespan. Monarchs are members of the milkweed butterfly family and lay their eggs only on milkweed. So many of us have created monarch way stations, beds of various milkweeds for monarchs in our gardens. All butterflies taste plants with their feet to determine if that is the correct plant for egg laying. Then they extend the abdomen, often under a leaf, and lay the eggs one at a time. So the next time you see a butterfly land on a non-flowering plant, take a closer look and you might witness it laying eggs just as this monarch is doing on common milkweed. And here on tropical milkweed, see how many eggs you can find in this photo. I'll give you a little help. In April and May, when monarchs are migrating north in the spring, milkweed may be just peeking through the ground. It doesn't need to be in bloom for them to find it and lay their eggs on it. The egg is tiny and easily overlooked, as you can see on the left. The tiny caterpillar hatches in three days, becomes an eating machine, and over the next one and a half to three weeks, it grows into this nearly full-grown caterpillar on the right. As the caterpillar eats and grows, its droppings, or frass, are sometimes the only clue that they're there. And when the caterpillar is full size, it attaches itself to a safe place and goes into the next life stage, a chrysalis, sometimes right on the milkweed, sometimes some distance away, but always off the beaten path. Eight to 11 days later, the adult butterfly has formed within the chrysalis and is ready to emerge. As it emerges, it slowly pumps fluids into its rumpled wings. So if you want to help monarch numbers swell, while they're here in the US spring through fall, it's truly as simple as planting milkweed in your garden or on your property, or a property where you have sway and convince someone else to plant it. The five best milkweeds for monarchs in the region include common milkweed, this one, a great nectar plant for many pollinators. Common milkweed is terrific for a meadow, so if you have one, plant it there and let it spread. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, those of us who garden for butterflies no longer tidy up. An unsightly common milkweed plant is beautiful to us. We leave it alone and cherish the many monarch caterpillars it supports well into the fall. Butterfly weed or orange milkweed is also a great nectar plant. Some of you may know it by the name Railroad Annie. Plant it in your poor soil where it's been tough to grow other plants. And here it is coming up around the foundation of an old building that is gone. It's low growing, as you can see, so ideal on garden edges. It'll stay where you put it and not spread like common milkweed. Believe it or not, butterfly weed is endangered in New Hampshire, threatened in Vermont, and has been extirpated 
in Maine. It is also an excellent meadow plant, needing no watering to speak of except when newly planted. Well, in Tennessee, several springs ago, I was thrilled to find glorious meadows full of it. I would love to see here in New Jersey, our state wildlife management area fields full of butterfly weed like this. I'm very hopeful that I'll see that day. Here is butterfly weed with a hungry monarch caterpillar on it. Swamp milkweed is the third one. This is an excellent garden plant. It likes a moist spot, but will do just fine if not wet. I have a mister set up over my patch, so the, gra the ground remains a bit moist. In some catalogs, for some reason, they're calling swamp milkweed red milkweed or rose milkweed. So be sure to double check the Latin name so that you're sure that you're purchasing swamp milkweed. Here's my patch of swamp milkweed with monarch caterpillars all over it on August 27th one year. And notice how denuded it became. Ugly to some, but beautiful to me. So it truly is in the eye of the beholder. There is a monarch caterpillar there on the lower left and the monarch emerging from its chrysalis right before my eyes. The fourth milkweed, world milkweed, is now available thanks to great native plant nurseries. World milkweed is very dainty and it flourishes in poor soil. And poke milkweed, like shady woodland areas and is quite distinctive. You're all very fortunate today. Native plants are much more readily available today than they were 30 years ago when I began looking for them and gardening for wildlife. Every spring, I put together a list of some sources of native plants. My handout is available on my website. It covers uh, New Jersey, Delaware, Eastern Pennsylvania, and Northern Maryland and the Pollinator Pathway website page for Lower Marion and Narberth directs you to native plant nurseries and sales in your area. This list is priceless. Visit it often so you don't miss special sales. Support these nurseries that grow and sell native plants. They will know what you're talking about when you ask about native plants and they will sell you plants propagated sustainably and not tainted with neonix and other hazards to the very pollinators that you're trying to benefit and attract. Be aware that the nursery down the street or big box stores have often treated their plants with neonicotinoids, which despite being approved by the EPA are directly responsible for caterpillars dying that feed on plants treated with neonix, a systemic insecticide that is absorbed by the plant treated with them, where it becomes part of the plant structure for the entire growing season, if not longer. So a milkweed purchased at a big box store that might be cheaper than the milkweed at a native plant nursery, it's been treated with neonix so it will not produce a single monarch caterpillar. But monarchs don't know that. They will lay their eggs on the plant and once hatched into caterpillars, the caterpillars are doomed when they feed on that neonic tainted milkweed. They will die. I recently learned that even the dew that collects on plants treated with neonix is lethal to bees that might collect the water and take it back to their nest. The state of Maryland was the first state to ban the sale of products containing neonix. May other states follow. Looking at a few other butterflies, cloudless sulfurs, and this is a big year for them, lay their eggs on partridge pea, a great meadow plant. During tours of private wildlife gardens that I led, a group found a number of caterpillars on my patch of partridge pea, so camouflaged 
and a treat to find one going into its chrysalis. And I'm out of words for this. The cloudless sulfur chrysalis is truly beyond beautiful. If you've planted and nurtured native trees, shrubs, vines, wildflowers, grasses in your yard, the butterflies nectaring in your garden have no need to leave in search of the plant they need to lay their eggs on. For instance, spice bush swallowtails lay their eggs on the shrub spice bush and on sassafras trees. The caterpillar hides in curled shut leaves. Gently pry the leaf open and there it is, initially looking like a bird dropping, the one on the right, to keep hungry birds from eating it, and as it grows larger, looking more like a snake, the one on the left. Again, a deterrent for hungry birds. Tiger swallowtails nectar in the garden. Here a male on the left, female on the right, here on Joe Pieweed. And tiger swallowtails lay their eggs on tulip tree, sweet bay magnolia, and their caterpillars also hide in a silked shut leaf. And they too look like a bird dropping initially and later like a snake. Red banded hair streaks lay their eggs on winged sumac, this lovely native shrub whose berries are very beneficial to hungry migrating birds. Juniper hair streaks lay their eggs on red cedar. This one is on its host plant and the juniper hair streak caterpillar is tiny and blends in with the cedar needles. A few more points about butterfly biology. Butterflies are solar powered. So if the sun goes in or a rain shower passes over, they're vulnerable and can't fly. During overcast and rainy conditions, butterflies slip down into the vegetation and hide, like this question mark under a leaf, or down into a hedgerow thicket of grasses and shrubbery, like this American lady. This is another essential element of butterfly gardening, the need to provide sheltered areas where butterflies can survive storms or simply roost when a cloud comes over or through the night. In nature, thickets and woodland edges serve this purpose. In our gardens, it is usually shrub borders. This brings us to another important aspect of butterfly biology. How do butterflies spend the winter? You might own or have considered buying a butterfly house. They're cute, pretty, but they're really just a money-making gimmick since there are only three species of butterflies in our area that winter as adult butterflies that may use them. The three species are more likely to crawl down inside a hollow tree, and you can see how this tree would have provided a safe haven in winter. Sadly, it was cut down, but the three species that winter as adults may crawl down into your wood pile, under shutters or shingles, under a bit of bark that's pulled loose. So we created our own butterfly house from a fallen tree and old fence posts. And we placed roof shingles in between the layers to keep the weather out. The three species that winter as adult butterflies include this one, the morning cloak, and this one is in its winter nook. Imagine if a spider finds it. It will be a short-lived winter. And here's what it looks like if it hasn't been all messed up by spiders and other hungry insects through the winter. The Eastern comma is the second species, named for that silvery comma on the underside, and the question mark, told from the comma by the comma and a dot on the underside of its wing. But most butterflies, through winter, winter in an earlier life stage as an egg, a partially grown caterpillar protected in a curled up leaf, or a chrysalis attached to a plant stem. And this awareness has changed how I maintain my garden and my property. By leaving the garden standing through the winter, I am ensuring that they have a chance and haven't been sent off to the landfill 
or are rotting at the bottom of a compost pile. This is also one of the many reasons a meadow is left standing all winter. Many butterflies and moths winter in and under fallen leaves below the host plant. For this reason, I'm not a leaf raker. Realizing that doing so would be sending next year's butterflies off forever. Some butterflies winter as a chrysalis, like this tiger swallowtail chrysalis that I found one winter on my tulip tree. For all these reasons, I am not a garden neatnik. I found that nature is a good excuse to be a more relaxed gardener. The knowledge that my garden is full of butterfly eggs, caterpillars, and chrysalises scattered throughout, indeed the next generation of butterflies, gives me a reason not to be too tidy in the garden and to leave the garden standing through winter. To think that next year's butterflies are safely wintering, wintering over in all this standing vegetation has taught me that this is a beautiful sight. Remember, it is all in the eye of the beholder. Signs like this, I think they say it all. Two, I found that spent flower heads left standing are full of seeds. So when pollinators are done with the flowers, their seeds turn the butterfly garden into a giant bird feeder. American goldfinch love my garden because I don't deadhead my spent flowers, like these purple cone flowers. And right now they're all over my sunflowers. Once folks learn to leave a garden cleanup until spring, they often wonder when it is safe to do the garden cleanup. That varies year to year. After a stretch of warm days in February or some years that occurs in March, maybe even early April, when I begin seeing more and more perennials peeking through the soil, that's when I begin the garden cleanup process. Here, white turtle head. Simply snap off last year's stalks, load them into a wheelbarrow, and what I do is lay them loosely on the ground in our woods or around the edge of our property. That way butterfly eggs, caterpillars, or chrysalises can still go through the rest of their life cycle. Two, I've had some of these lovely garden plants seed in our woods. Leave sturdy, sizable stems standing. In other words, break them off at a height of about 18 inches for the native bees. Some native bees will lay their eggs in this stem stubble and very soon the plants will grow up and hide them. So if you think this is unsightly, it's a short-lived unsightliness. So the garden in January, some years it warms up enough by late February that I begin the garden cleanup then, other years not until early or mid-March or even April, and in no time the perennials fill it in and voila. As a pollinator gardener, avoid the use of pesticides, not only for all the reasons all of us have mentioned already, but many birds eat insects in our gardens and carry bills full of bugs to their nests full of hungry young. Butterflies and many other important pollinators are insects and insecticides and pesticides are gonna kill them. Pesticides almost always do in more species than the target species. Sprays that kill aphids will no doubt kill caterpillars and butterflies too. There is an alternative, often a pest species will attack predators naturally, just as these aphids drew in hungry ladybugs, devouring one aphid after another. And learn your bugs. Don't mistake ladybug larvae for a garden pest. Ladybugs also go through metamorphosis and their larval stage feasts on aphids too. A butterfly and hummingbird garden is far more than just that. 
These gardens are havens for beneficial pollinators like our native bees, wasps, flies. Insect eating birds are attracted and benefit. Love your spiders, they have to eat too. And I've used my own garden as a teaching garden during workshops and garden tours here in mid-September. Consider when it's a safer time, giving folks a tour of your garden. Get them hooked. Show them nectar plants in action. Caterpillar plants adorned with caterpillars. There is much talk and emphasis on going green, but sadly, it has not reached many landscapers and gardeners. Many lawn and garden maintenance tasks and practices are deadly to wildlife. The amount of herbicides used to ensure that there is not a single dandelion frightens me. Yards like this are not sustainable. They drink thousands of gallons of water and depend on fertilizers and other wasteful pamperings. With this being the standard lawn and non-native plantings, it truly is a wonder we see any butterflies or pollinators at all. So as more and more of us consider wildlife when we plant trees and shrubs and flowers, our neighborhoods will become less sterile, more inviting, our yards will be more sustainable, including native plantings that benefit wildlife and require minimal care, as opposed to the typical yard across the street, neat as a pin, ugly as sin. As your pollinator garden evolves, some words of advice, keep a journal of what you see in your garden, create plenty of seating nooks, arbors, benches, and take the time to relax and enjoy your garden and all its visitors. Take photographs from the same spot each month to show your garden's evolution. Here in July and August and September, and from our roof in June and mid-August and late September. Work with what you have. If your backyard is a woodland, by all means, don't cut it down to create a butterfly garden. Keep those lovely shade trees in your backyard, especially if they're native, and enjoy all the songbirds that pass through the yard eating caterpillars in your native trees. And if your only son is in the front yard, well then, that's where you want to put your butterfly garden. And lastly, consider what you will see when looking out of your window, not just what the neighbors will see from the road. If I've excited you and you're ready to create pollinator habitat, but are overwhelmed and don't know where to start, remember this. If you can take just 10% of your lawn area and make it more wildlife friendly, that will make a huge difference. Play around with a garden hose to outline some possible sites for a new garden bed. And as you change 10% of your yard, you will immediately see wildlife responding and benefiting. And once you're hooked, maybe tackle another 10% the following year. This is March 2014. And here it is in May of the same year. And two years later, and late fall of that same year. So whether you embrace this wild and crazy world of gardening for wildlife with all you've got, or take small steps in that direction, you will make a difference. This is uh, Dolores Amesbury's yard, and she took workshops, a series of them that I taught in 2014. And this was her mowed side yard, and she wanted to make a change, make some habitat. And here is her 10% change. This garden is one and a half months old. Wildlife found it immediately, and it was such an inspiration that I included Dolores's garden on a series of tours of private wildlife gardens that I led that year. So once you see how much more wildlife is attracted to your new garden, 
you'll be hooked and making that 10% change every year, if not sooner. Doug Tallamy and Rick Dark's book, The Living Landscape, covers the next chapter in wildlife gardening, creating a more natural layered landscape. Less lawn, less mowing, and instead layers of native ground covers, perennials, shrubs, understory trees, and canopy trees. I began planting a layered landscape under my tulip tree seven years ago. Previously, we'd mowed under there. I planted wild columbine, which would bloom in the spring, lyre leaf sage, which also blooms in the spring, common blue wood aster, white wood aster, which bloom in the fall, a shrub, American strawberry bush, and an understory tree, alternate leaf dogwood. So the few plants that bloom in the spring gave it color and then through the summer and early fall, it's largely green. But right now, September, late September, early October, the area lights up with blooming common blue wood asters and white wood asters. And this new layered landscape is now one less area to mow, no longer boring and bare, flourishing with growth and blooms. The perennials are seeding and spreading profusely, much to my delight, taking up a bigger and bigger patch under the tulip tree. There are so many seedlings that I can even begin moving a few to spots where I want new layered gardens in under trees rather than lawn. So it's a win-win. We focus primarily on sun-loving plants because butterflies are solar powered and drawn to gardens in the sun. But if your yard is largely shady, there is a lot that you can do to benefit pollinators. Create a woodland shade garden with all the lovely blooming perennials that are available at native plant nurseries now. And this is one of my favorite shade loving spring bloomers, golden ragwort and wild columbine in my woods. Many of us got into wildlife gardening by putting in a butterfly garden this next chapter of wildlife gardening, creating living landscapes with layers throughout our yards, brings a world of wonder within easy reach. Many native perennials grow tall, embrace every inch of that height, and realize what great cover it provides and wealth of blooms. Plant a truly green garden for butterflies, hummingbirds, bees, and more, and they will find it. Visit my website for lots of helpful information. The link is at the, um, at the bottom of this photograph. And when you're at my website, you can join my gardening gang by clicking on either the top link or the link further down the page. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Pat, for that wonderful talk that you just gave. So, I am going to hand select some of these questions and send them your way. I'm gonna share my screen. Super, um, thank you. And get back to- Stop sharing if I can do that. Thank Good. you, yeah. Yes. So um, thank you again, everybody for joining. Um, if you have a question, now would be the time to throw it in there. Um, so I'm gonna start with one that someone just sent. So do insects overwinter in stalks of ornamental grasses? Is it better to cut them back in the early spring rather than the late fall? Good question. Um, if I had ornamental grasses on my property, I would think about replacing them with some of the beautiful native grasses. So um, a number of our butterflies, what they lay their eggs in are native grasses. So they cannot use those, they can't use non-native grasses that many nurseries sell. But the native plant nurseries uh, do have native grasses. Some are tall, some are low, they're exquisite. So maybe slowly try to put in native grasses and yes, they need to be maintained by cutting them back. And I do it in the spring and because you've got overwintering insects in them, you don't want to take the, the grass that you've cut away. You want to lay it around the base of the plant 
because some of the butterflies like common wood nymph um, and uh, Zabulon skipper, Delaware skipper, uh, they winter as a partially grown caterpillar and they're on those cuttings that you've just taken away. So you wanna lay them so the caterpillars can crawl back to the new growth. Thank you. So uh, the, I'm sure there's many dog owners on this call. So Karen has asked if you have any ideas for replacing turf in a yard with active dogs. Would buffalo grass work? So far, all the sedges she's researched say they won't hold up to the heavy dog traffic. I'm not an expert on uh, planting some sort of turf. Um, we had two English setters, which were very rambunctious and um, quite a bit of our yard was open for them and our grass was whatever came up. So it was crabgrass, um, it was uh, some of the weedy plants, clover that I seeded in. So other than that, maybe someone else could better answer that question. Sure. I have heard, I don't have a specific name, but perhaps I have heard that there are some great clover mixes out there. Maybe Michelle has a better option or specific name to recommend. I really don't. The, you know, the clover comes on its own in my experience. If you just keep mowing low, um, so much will pop up, including violets, which are just wonderful in lawns and um, creates sort of a mini natural meadow that way. It's hard with the dogs. Um, I have that trouble myself actually. So there are just some bare spots and I keep reseeding them and, and allowing uh, basically the violets and the clover to move in on their own. So Chris, thank you, Michelle. Chris has a question. My bee balm is covered in mildew. Is it better to cut it down to the ground and remove it from the garden or leave it over the winter? So that is a great question. And it's a question that many people have. And as a wildlife gardener, I don't see that mildew or whatever it's called on my bee balm. I look past it. I see the flowers, the plants still are healthy. They're flowering lushly. They're covered with pollinators and I don't even notice that. If it is a wet year, you're gonna end up with that. <clears throat> so certainly don't cut it down um, because it's habitat. It's, it's going to this time of year provide cover through the winter and you're going to get brand new growth in the spring. So it's not as if that will um, create unhealthy plants next spring. If you end up with it next year, it's going to be because we have a lot of rain. Thank you. So there are several questions about when to cut things back, but I think in your talk you said you kind of have to, there's not a date. It's not April 5th right. or something. So mm -hmm. if you want to maybe uh, recap your thoughts on that. Yes. Yeah, so for uh, cleaning up the garden after the winter, I wait until there is a stretch of mild days that are where you want to get out in the yard. You know, if you have a day here or there, that's not when you want to do it. That day here or there is when in the winter or early spring is when you want to get out and tackle invasive plants that you need to pull out and um, situations like that. But for cleaning up the whole garden, I wait until there's a lengthy stretch of pleasant days. And that's when I do it. And that's when I start to see a lot of the perennials really showing themselves. Thank you. And I think you mentioned something important, getting out and getting out to get after the invasives. And one of the things too about uh, planting for pollinators that we've been touched upon in this talk is that you don't want to just remove something. You want to replace it with something that's valuable for, um, for these pollinators. So if you love butterflies, that's something for butterflies. Um, I know a lot of people go right to oak trees because they're so valuable for so many pollinators and wildlife. Um, so one per Lynn had the question, is yellow butterfly weed as beneficial as the more common orange butterfly weed? I think they're both very, very beneficial. 
So I don't know that one over the other is more beneficial. Okay. The more common is the orange. Sure. Okay. But in the wild every now and then yellow is found. And so as the seeds are collected, so people end up with a yellow version sometimes. Right. There was a question also about um, propagating milkweed. Do you have recommendations for propagation or do you send, would you recommend that people get plugs or seeds? Um, as a wildlife gardener, I have, um, I like to support native plant nurseries. And when I go to them, they have done all the hard work. And a lot of people don't realize what you have to do with milkweed seeds. They cannot sit on your desk in your house all winter and then be planted. They need to go through this cold stratification. So um, either you can, if you collect seeds, you can plant them in the fall, just not very deep at all, just scratch the surface and lay them down where you want that milkweed to grow. Um, or go to a nursery where they've gone through all the hard work and actually have a viable plant with roots. And I feel good about supporting plant nurseries, native plant nurseries. They're, it's, it's hard because they're competing with the everyday nursery along the road that is full of showy, non-native, gaudy stuff that everyone wants to buy because it's pretty. And the native plant nursery has not forced all their plants into this lush bloom. It's, you know, it often doesn't look like too much. So I definitely like supporting native plant nurseries. And then I have the plant. It's going to bloom that year rather than me waiting to see if that seed's going to do something. Yes, that's great advice. And for everyone, um, the there are there's a plant list and a list of local native nurseries on the Pollinator Pathway for Lower Marion and Arbor uh, website. So you guys will have all the information you need about that. Um, all right. So let me scroll down, see if there's any further questions. Um, Someone asked about ground cover. So what would you recommend for replacing ivy and vinca on as a ground cover? Um, I love what's happening under my tulip tree. So that stand of uh, common blue wood aster is pretty tall. If you want it lower, you can give it haircuts and it'll bloom lower. So it could be more like a ground cover that way. Um, lyre leaf sage I have in my woods and that is almost like a ground cover. It gets so thick. Um, I am blanking out. Can some other people jump in with some uh, ground covers that they? There's some in the chat um, that people have listed. So. Again, that'll be on plant, the plant lists and such. Mm -hmm. You can do a little research to look through um, what, depending on your shade or sun, um, to give more specialized options. Two, um, if, if people have Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, in his appendices, he lists ground covers. He has a great list of native ground covers. And that's great. Uh, for specific hard situations, yeah. yeah. And now that it's starting to get colder again, everybody should get Doug's book and do some yes. reading about native plants and pollinators. Yes. Um, so uh, someone asked, are any of the perennial herbs good for pollinators? I have marjoram in my garden and butterflies come to it. Um, I have uh, fennel for black swallowtails and you don't think of the flower as being much of anything, but I have seen some butterflies on it. Uh, maybe some other people have some, I see someone is sharing here. Um, I've heard that uh, dill and parsley attract caterpillars. I'm not sure if that's the right thing for them to eat, but. Yeah, bl black swallowtails, I didn't include, uh, the, the program that I have is probably twice as long as what I gave tonight. So I viciously yanked a lot of it out and I did not include the whole life cycle of the black swallowtail. 
which uh, needs parsley, fennel, dill, Queen Anne's lace, carrot, which is what Queen Anne's lace is, carrot gone wild. <laughs> uh, caterpillars on those things become black swallowtails. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So um, someone asked, when's the best time to start my native pollinator garden? Right now. Uh, a great <laughs> yes. time is either in the spring or the fall because you have more rainfall and you don't have to pamper. I mean, you really need to pamper new plantings. You, um, I hear people say, oh, I'm going to plant a native plant garden. I won't ever have to water it. Um, if you put in new plants, they do need some pampering until they set down roots and adjust to the new location. So by planting right now, uh, if rainfall is occurring, you're not having to water these newly planted plants. And the same is true in spring. Uh, middle of the summer when it's so hot is a very hard time to start a garden. So I, I'd go, go for it right now. Yeah, we agree. The Conservancy is definitely fans of fall planting and um, yes. you might even get, catch some sales this kind of end, end of the season at local um, nurseries. Uh, yeah. So Linda Pitt, our uh, esteemed president of the Narberth Garden Club, asked if the um, milkweed beetles harm the milkweed plant. Um, there's a wonderful book about milkweed and monarchs. It's called Milkweed, Monarchs and More. And um, it's a kid's book, but it's illustrated with beautiful photographs. And it shows you all the creatures that have to live on milkweed. So milkweed beetles, milkweed bugs, they're part of the milkweed package. And people might plant milkweed for monarchs and then kind of freak out because these other creatures are there on the plant, but they have to live there as well. Um, and some of them will feed on the seeds in seed pods. They're not really harming the monarch. They're not harming the monarch egg or caterpillar. Um, so they add interest to the plant. Yes. So I was wondering with the milkweed, um, with the neonics on them, what, is that something that after a couple of years that might cycle out? Like if you have one of those plants that may have been bought at the wrong nursery, do you need to remove that or will the toxins fade away? Uh, I am afraid that the neonics can live for a number of years in a shrub that's been treated with neonics. And I purchased, um, I purchased some native shrubs at a plant sale at a nature center and they acquired them from a source that was still using neonics and took quite a bit of convincing to stop using them. So they didn't know what else to use. Right. And, uh, you know, their plants had to be insect free to be sold. So um, thankfully, they're getting better information now um, from their advisors at this nursery. But yeah. It's pretty frightening. Yeah, that that is indeed not ideal. So yeah. have uh, the someone asked? Um, we heard the rumor that milkweed kills lanternflies. Have you? Is there any truth to that? I just heard that today, so I haven't had time oh. to research it myself. Terrific. <laughs> I I don't know. That's news to me. I have to say, we do not have them here yet. So I am not as educated as many others on the land. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, just about a month ago, I led a spotted lanternfly webinar for Conservancy folks mm -hmm. online. And, you know, I don't know that the lanternflies would be super attracted to milkweed, but if they did feed on their sap, it does have poisons in it. So I could see it killing on them, but I don't know what would bring them to a milkweed by choice, by chance, perhaps. Um, yeah. Yeah. Someone's in the chat says it's true. So better, even more reason to plant more milkweed, yes. grow it, and buy it from your local nurseries, um, et cetera. Um, Pat, so that is the majority of the questions I see on there that you didn't answer um, thoroughly in your presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up. So 
thank you so much, Pat, for joining us. Thank you, Linda and Michelle, for partnering with the Conservancy to really bring this forward um, into Lower Marion and Narberth. And for everyone else, uh, if you join this program, please be consider becoming a member of the Lower Marion Conservancy. Um, you can check us out on our website, lmconservancy.org. We do a lot of different in-person and online events. We've got five, I think, events coming up this fall. We're doing botanical dyeing with goldenrod, a mushroom hunt, a uh, history of medicinal plants tour, um, and so much more. So please check us out. Um, you can also find the pollinator pathway information for registering your property and getting a lawn sign on our website. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, have a nice night. Thank you, Amy. Good night, everyone. Yeah, thank you all so much. This was great. Thank, thank you. Yeah. I learned so much. Thank you.